Today, at the United States Capitol in Washington, D.C., and at the Nevada State Capitol in Carson City, stand bronze statues honoring a larger-than-life historical figure. Sarah Winnemucca was a Paiute leader who stood for peace between the races, at a time when white settlers and the native peoples were caught in a deep divide. She spent her life building bridges across the chasm, and at times she was cast out by both sides. But her contributions endured, and today she represents Nevada in the nation's capital, serving as an inspiration to all who come before her. To deepen our understanding of this remarkable woman, we'll follow Sarah's footprints to the places in Nevada that figured prominently in her own life. Our story begins at Pyramid Lake, Sarah's ancestral home. As far as we know, Sarah had no children, but she was part of a big family and especially close to her brother Natchez, who established a ranch that is still operated by his descendants. Today, his great-granddaughter Dorothy Ely and her family connect back to the old ways through music. The flower dance is done by the young ladies, teenagers. Sarah's uh, Indian name was Somi Tonigya. Somi Tonigya Minu Nani. In English, that means shell flower. On this day, as they often do, Dorothy and her daughter Sherry carry flowers to Natchez's grave, just west of the ranch. Sarah's uh, brother and him and Sarah both work very close together, trying to work to get the Paiute people and the people that were coming in, taking over the lands, to get along. She wanted to educate people, and it was about educating. And I think that spirit is still alive here with her people and with Native people, Native women especially, on this reservation. I have here a book uh, written by Sarah about her life and... Uh, uh, things that were going on at the time. According to my mom, uh, the, her grandmother told her Sarah is telling the truth when she talks about her book and what she's written in it. Although Sarah Winnemucca died in 1891, her voice endures through the words she penned in English in her famous book, Life Among the Paiutes. I was born somewhere near 1844, but I'm not sure of the precise time. I was a very small child when the first white people came into our country. They came like a lion, yes, like a roaring lion, and have continued ever since, and I have never forgotten her first coming. My grandfather was chief of the entire Paiute nation and was camped near Humboldt Lake. With Dr. Sally Zanjani, who has researched and written extensively about Sarah Winnemucca, we set out to the Humboldt Sink, about 60 miles east of Reno. Sally, this land is huge. This is big land. Do we have any sense of what, where Sarah was born out here? She talks about the Humboldt Lake, but I don't really see a lake. I see big flats. It was very different in Sarah's day from what you're seeing now. Sarah said she was born near Humboldt Lake, which is northeast of here, or was in Sarah's time. The Humboldt River, winding its way across the western deserts, lost itself here in this region in marshes, lakes, and lush meadowlands. Sarah's band was based at Pyramid Lake, but they were hunter-gatherers, and they w ranged widely. They had probably come here for the annual mud hen hunt. When those little black ducks lose their feathers in molting and can't fly anymore, then Paiute men in tule boats tied together with cattails would pole over the waters and drive the mud hens into nets which they had stretched across the mouth of the river. Then the Paiutes would feast on roasted mud hen. At this time, Sarah's mother, Tabwatoni, would have been making a basket for her baby, a narrow boat of willows lined with feathers. She could carry this, the baby in this basket as she walked or rock the baby on her knees. 
Sarah Early became a favorite of her grandfather, Truckee, who may have recognized her special qualities. To better understand how Sarah's people lived at that time, we travel 40 miles west, where the Truckee River runs into Pyramid Lake, to talk with Paiute tribal member Ralph Burns. What would have been the most abundant time for them? Probably, I would think, during the springtime when the fish are, both the two fish, the kuyui and the agai, which is the trout, are coming up the river. Everything is, is coming out, uh, seeds of the plants. Because the fish came up the river, you know, twice in the spring, then also during the fall. And the fall catch, what they did, put them in the caves, you know, all with along the tule mats, because, you know, these mats have some kind of acid in them that repel small insects. And they would just let nature take its course and dry them up. Was it a good life? I think it probably was a happy life. It was no, they didn't have to worry about anything. Everything was pretty much here. With the coming of the settlers, everything changed for Sarah's people. In 1857, to learn the ways of the white newcomers, Sarah and her sister were sent off to live in the fledgling community of Genoa, 60 miles southwest of Pyramid Lake. Tucked in against the massive Sierra Nevada range, the Mormon fort was a critical outpost as settlers poured west. My sister and I were living at this time in Genoa with Major Ormsby's family who took us as playmates for their little girl. While with them, we learned English very fast, for they were very kind to us. In that year, our white brothers had houses along the Carson River. We lived there, and we lived that way in peace for another year. Of course, Genoa has changed a great deal, but since they rebuilt the old stockade and the old building behind me, it resembles somewhat Genoa as Sarah knew it. Sarah's family were very anxious for her to learn English, and to learn the white man's ways so she could get along in the strange new world that had been thrust upon the Indians. And Sarah did learn English very rapidly in just a few months. She had quite a gift for languages and ultimately she spoke several. The Ormsby's had great ambitions. William Ormsby was buying a lot of real estate. He had high political aspirations and he was able to gorgeously gown his wife. There aren't many pictures from this era, but there is one that shows us how Margaret Ormsby looked. Must have been quite an experience for Sarah. I do think that Margaret Ormsby, who later, after the death of William Ormsby in the Pyramid Lake War, became quite a force in her own right, may have shown Sarah what a strong woman could do in the white world. It's interesting to think that in many years, this Paiute girl who worked in the Ormsby household would far eclipse the very ambitious William Ormsby. We next follow Sarah's footprints northwest about 20 miles to a canyon on the east side of Mount Davidson. After she left the Ormsby's, Sarah came to live with her brothers and her older sister in Gold Canyon, where prospectors were plastering for gold two years prior to the discovery of the great Comstock Lode. Henry Comstock, that great blowhard who claimed everything and discovered nothing, employed Indian labor. The big rendezvous for the prospectors in Gold Canyon was John Town, and the big event was a dance at the John Town Saloon. A story is told of Sarah at one of these dances where women were very scarce. When the fiddle struck up, the John Towners would dance so vigorously they raised splinters from the floor and they do their fanciest dancing in front of Sarah to persuade her to join them. We pick up Sarah's trail a few miles north at the historic mining town of Virginia City. Today it attracts tourists eager for a glimpse into its unruly heyday. Sarah went there in 1864, a mere four years after the Pyramid Lake War, which pitted Paiutes against settlers and claimed the lives of many. But gold and silver had been discovered and nothing could stop the frenzy. 